Right. <laughs> okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our, I think it's our, about our 14th seminar in this series. Um, just for people who don't um, or haven't um, joined us before, generally we're thinking about the pandemic. We're trying to think philosophically about the pandemic, about what it means, about how to live with it, and um, particularly yes. now in our in our kind of second um, set of these um, seminars, less trying to understand the thing and more trying to think about how to live with it, how we have been living with it, and all sorts of diverse perspectives have come up on how we are starting to, starting to look like it might become a feature of our human being for the rest of time. I mean, I know we're all hoping, oh, well, this is the end of it. We're over it. It's going to finish now. Let's get our lives back. But the reality is that we're probably not going to get our lives back from COVID for a while. Um, so anyway, that's <laughs> part of, of what we're grappling with um, in, in the series. And um, this time we have um, a very interesting perspective on, on the pandemic. Um, creative activity. What do artists do? Um, in isolation, how, what are the challenges? What are the, the issues? And, and we have um, uh, Prof. Wulind Lelanyoni, we have Ernestine White and Jessica Staple, and they will be uh, chatting to us, um, giving us their perspectives. Um, it'll be a conversation. Um, and yes, over to you three. I'm going to disappear myself, as I said. And um, yeah, thank you. And mute myself. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Andrea, or Prof. Hurst. Um, we, I'm excited about this uh, conversation that we're going to have, and I, and I do want to stress that it is a conversation. Um, the three of us, um, I think, have um, some history together, but uh, we'll, I'll, I'll hand over to each of us to introduce ourselves at, at the moment, in a moment. Um, but I think um, in terms of what we're presenting today is really an outlook from our three different perspectives on the pandemic, as you say, the, the lockdown and the effects um, on um, the creative industry, um, the likes of which I don't think many people sort of really feel the impact of until they're told that you can't go to a theater, you can't go to the movies and so forth. So it would be, um, you know, sort of a space in which now the three of us are reflecting and simply just sort of sharing our thoughts. So maybe just to begin in terms of introduction, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Professor Valinda Lagnoni. Um, I'm the head of department for visual arts um, at Nelson Mandela University. I'm a trained printmaker, practicing artist, and um, I've had my fair share of um, industry experience. And um, yeah, I, I tend to call myself a printmaker before an artist, but I suppose now in these in these days it is artist before printmaker. Um, <laughs> Ernestine. <laughs> Um, my name is Ernestine White Nifetu. I'm currently the director of the William Humphreys Art Gallery. I am also a, pra a practicing artist, also a printmaker, um, and just had have had a really broad opportunity to engage with artists on quite a number of levels. But in this conversation, I'll be speaking specifically about being a creative and making art during lockdown. Jessica? Thanks. Hi, I'm Jessica Staple. I am a practicing artist. I was also trained as a printmaker. I lecture at the Nelson Mandela University in the Department of Visual Arts, mainly in the fine arts stream. And I also teach at a local art school, Art on Target. And um, I'm also a member of a collective called the Black Ink Collective. And um, I may be speaking a little bit about that also during our presentations today. Um, but as Ernestina said, largely going to be focusing on being a creative in the space of lockdown. Cool. Thank you. So um, yeah, let's let's go for it. I think what we will do as the, as we as the presenta presentation goes, we will speak to each other. And at the end of the presentation, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box or. Um, um, you can ask us personally at the end of the presentation and such, but please feel free to, to ask us some questions at some point. So, um, apologies for that, that's my emails going off. Um, 
So I, I would, I w I'd like to start us off with my perspectives on things. And um, all three of us are practicing artists. And there is, I suppose there's a slight bias in that we all have a background in, in printmaking, but that doesn't say that we haven't been involved in the broader sense of the creative industry. As you see, Ernestine is a uh, curator. I've had my fair share of sitting on certain um, uh, competition boards and things like that. Um, and uh, national boards. And Jessica has also um, had a very strong public engagement and community building awareness and process, which she will speak about later. So I think in many respects, this, this conversation between the three of us comes at the right time where we, we are um, uh, looking to return and looking at the challenges that uh, creatives in the country have undergone um, during this lockdown. So the three of us will provide viewpoints and mull over our own personal experiences with some reflection on greater issues surrounding the plights of artists during lockdown. And hopefully these will trigger conversations among, amongst you guys as well. So my point is not to talk about the work that I make at this point. I'd, I'd rather reflect on the broader sense of where we find ourselves in South Africa and maybe even globally when we reflect on what creatives do. Um, um, my own practice is a different story at this point in time. I was compromised in terms of lockdown, but I think that my, my role in this conversation is to highlight some of the things that we, we um, maybe haven't heard of just as yet. So this slide here, um, I'll talk to the PowerPoint, but this is perhaps what people generally think of, you know, artists um, or the sort of romanticized ideal of like, this is what we, we are. We, we can work alone. We can be self-sustaining. We can find a, um, a place to work in solitude and produce these masterpieces. And then, you know, um, you know it's all of our, our sort of like um, expertise and then work in sort of this isolation and so forth. So in many respects, people thought, okay, artists are in lockdown, they're gonna be fine. You know, they're, they're, they, they can go back to their studios and start creating and so forth. Um, but at the end of it all, um, and this is taken from the, the Maverick, the lockdown affected not just people who would be working on their own um, uh, comfortably in their studios, but it affected the, the productivity of, 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 a, of a greater pool of people. You had, as this article says here, one of the lesser recognized victim, victims of the current pandemic plus economic shutdown. So I just need to move this here quickly. Um, uh, catastrophe has been the arts and culture sector, writ large in South Africa and globally. When a nation's entire roster of giant performing venues, stadiums, galleries, clubs, avant-garde performance spaces, museums, and festivals all go dark and stay dark pretty much simultaneously, and thus no money comes in for the individuals and organizations who compromise that sector. A growing number in that sphere are finding themselves on the bones of their metaphor metaphorical backsides. And that's an important thing to remember, that in, in many respects, um, going back to that sort of like romantic ideal, um, artists have generally been seen to be self-sufficient, um, um, or at least unless if they're employed by um, an institution such as a university to be an academic and so forth, the artistry seems to come from a place in which they need to, to sort of gear themselves. Um, particularly important to remember and frequently overlooked is that it is not just the actual performers, dancers and musicians, painters and sculptors in front of audiences, or whose works are seen by potential purchasers, who are the ones who are suffering? One experienced public relations professional in the arts and, and culture sphere reminded that for every performer, there are at least 12 or more people, highly skilled technicians and junior, people alike, junior support people alike, now finding the water rising around them as well. This runs from an internationally recognized lighting designer for a stage, television, film, with dozens of years experience to the most junior of ticket takers and ushers. They're all in trouble now, unless they manage to save furiously for these lean, new lean years. So what we're really talking about here is the idea of art as an economy. Um, and when, when the pandemic hit South Africa, uh, the Department of Arts and Culture rolled out a, a relief fund, you know, the idea that we could pay out um, a certain amount of money to, to support um, the, 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 the struggling artists, or at least artists who would be um, in some ways seen as um, in need if they were taken away from their jobs, taken away from working in theater, taken away from working with musicians and bands and so forth. 
Um, and I just want to quote here, a 150 million relief fund, which is to be shared by artists and athletes, was announced by the department on the 25th of March with criteria for applications uh, announced on the 29th of March. The submission deadline was initially set for April 4, but was extended to 6 April because many artists um, were not able to attain the necessary documents in time. So at that point, 5,000 applications went in and only 488 artists had been paid out eight weeks after the relief fund was announced. The, there were subsequent calls, of course, for uh, applications and things like that, but up to this date, we are still seeing that people have been living with absolutely nothing. Um, in the entire space of our um, lockdown. So, um, uh, you may have seen images such as this one. These are the campaigns that started to come through. Um, the one on the left-hand side is basically people who worked in the uh, theater industry, music industry, uh, the entertainment industry, basically. Um, and um, the call at that point was a silent protest of um, using red lights um, and a, a calling awareness to the, the very highly threatened economy of the theater industry and the, um, and the creative arts as a function of society and in terms of the threatening of job creation and entrepreneurship and um, trying to shift people to see that, you know, it really isn't art as a pastime, but art as a, as a social necessity, as a national asset. And then the latest one being a march that actually happened this last Wednesday, um, organized by a, a, a range of different organizations down at the bottom that you can see at the bottom of the poster, um, that was to mark to um, the center of uh, our main cities. Um, I think the biggest one was, um, biggest ones were Pretoria and Cape Town. Um, demanding that um, as we now move to level one, fortunately we're moving from to Sunday, that um, relief be found and venues be opened and um, consider considerations be made to re-energize and, and re-inject um, um, uh, capital back into you know, people's lives um, who are desperately needed at this point in time. So the question out of this for me really was how many answers do artists have to the difficulties of being self-sufficient um, only then to be crippled economy, economically during the period of national lockdown. And it kind of goes back to that, that original image where we had the romantic artists sort of working self-sufficiently and so forth. Um, and, um, and being in some ways, none the wiser to uh, an incident such as the pandemic, which would suddenly shut everything down. Um, so the space in which, or the answer to many of the, 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 the restrictions that were placed on, on going to places, going to theaters, going to movie, movie houses and going to galleries and things like that had been ans answered through the space of the virtual. Um, for those of us in, in, in the teaching space, we, we moved to the virtual teaching space for me, for, for the last few weeks, um, the Virtual Arts, um, uh, National Arts Festival, for which I was very much um, uh, honored to be part of as a, a board member um, of the selection committee. Um, that was the first time that happened in this country. The National Theatre in England were broadcasting free shows on the internet. The Turban Art, Art Fair went virtual as well. Uh, comedy shows such as that by um, Donovan Goliath um, went online, but you'd still have to buy tickets and so forth. Certain museums and galleries across the world open their, their museums to a, a virtual experience where you would be able to navigate the actual um, environment and so forth. But how was that going to sustain, or how is that going to sustain in, in many respects, the, the question that is raised and the uh, original quote I had with the, the multitudes of people, the, 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 the other people who work from the ticket ushers to the ticket sellers to the people who stand in the galleries and so forth. How is that creative industry um, nourished by, or at least maintained or made sustainable through, um, through um, government intervention? I want to stop there and have um, Ernestine and um, Jessica present their, their, their positions and how they've been working um, going forward. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bulind Lela. Um, before I, I speak about my work, I just wanted to kind of comment on what you've just said. Um, and I think firstly, 
the idea that artists are self-sufficient is is a is a true ideal. Um, I think many people still don't understand that um, in order to survive as an artist, you have to really engage in. There's a broader ecosystem, you yes. know, that is required in order to truly survive as an artist. Right. And um, so that ideal of being in the studio, um, making work, and then someone discover you in your studio, and you know you become famous is long gone. I don't, I don't even know if it actually existed. It mm. really is about um, artists and this day and age really being connected to each other, um, um, being able to talk about their work with a broad range of people or, or groups. And then to network. I know it's something that most people as artists don't like to do is through networking, through engaging with each other is how you are able to actually sustain your practice. Um, so for me, the, the question of, you know, how have we since before COVID been, been able to sustain ourselves and now that you know, COVID has taken away what we thought we already had or took for granted is something that's quite interesting because I find that um, as someone who works in an institution who, um, whose responsibility and goal is to support artists, um, whether they known or unknown, um, this particular time period is extremely difficult. Of course. Um, <laughs> unlike before where they were maybe perhaps able to physically go and show a gallery their artwork. Now you have to either have Wi-Fi, you have to have a laptop, you have to have all these kind of technological um, additional um, attachments to your, your body and your, 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 your body of work that some artists are not able to, to mm. have. So already then now they're, they're literally cut off from the rest of the world. Because right. everything, as you mentioned, is now virtual. Everything is online. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the rural area of somewhere and you have amazing work, but you don't have access to internet, you don't have a laptop, you know, it becomes a huge disadvantage. So that's something I just thought um, we should kind of lay out there is the reality of, of artists is so broad um, depending on where you are in, in your in your creative um, kind of mm -hmm. language, where you are economically, socio, um, sociologically, um, in terms of what are you able to do knowing that you don't have what you need? How are you able to work with what you have? Yeah. And that I think from the beginning is kind of a mental thing, is mm -hmm. that um, before you're able to, I don't know for myself, you know, um, it was really about um, telling myself as a creative that irrespective of what I don't have, what am I able to do to still be um, creative? And, um, and so this idea of, you know, virtual spaces has been really exciting, I think, in that uh, although it cuts off a group of people from not being able to experience physically performances, exhibitions, um, because they don't have what I've just mentioned. It also opens up uh, a, a bigger community of people who maybe would never have gone to a national arts festival and in the comfort of their own home, somewhere else in, in the country or outside of the country actually, now they're able to see what creatives in Southern Africa and in South Africa are able to do and then open up possibilities for them to be exposed and um, to be supported in other ways. So I find that extremely exciting. Yes, I know it was extremely challenging, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll leave it at that. So um, with regards to my work, um, I started uh, creating work predominantly because I went on maternity leave. Just tell me when to move to the next one. Shall I move to? Next. Okay. Um, I went on maternity leave and I, um, in between breastfeeding and trying to re-navigate my body, um, I needed to find ways to just remember who I was as a creative. 
And um, so looking at uh, what's been happening in, in the broader uh, global society, um, trying to find ways to comment on what's happening. So whether it's in South Africa or outside. And um, my practice has really been for this past few months since lockdown, um, because I don't have a studio, my studio is my kitchen table, um, is that uh, I have for quite some number of years collected magazine cutouts and then kind of stored everything away for a while. And then now during this time of my maternity leave was the ideal time to start again. And how I work has always been looking at an image or um, that kind of sparks an idea and then literally letting it be a intuitive process for me. And at the end of most of the works, I find um, things that are actually happening currently that then kind of pop up in the work that I do. So the first image of um, there's no place to hide was really about um, speaking about what's been happening in the US in terms of um, police brutality, um, but also similarly what's been happening in South Africa. And so looking at the, the duality of, of realities between South Africa currently um, and individuals um, dying at the hands of police and also um, broadly what's been happening for quite a long time in, in the United States. Um, and then we can just move on to the other slides. Similarly, uh, this one in particular, um, uh, I really am drawn to because during this COVID time, you know, um, really you mentioned there's been all these efforts, the government's efforts to provide relief to um, a broad range of, of, of citizenry. And all I could think about is the single mother, you know, with her child, um, the domestic worker who now can't go and clean somebody's house. And that is how she survives. And um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a daughter of a woman who was a domestic worker for the greater part of her adult life, you know, I understand the challenges um, that go that go with that. And then you ask the question now, how how is she supposed to apply for UIF when most mm -hmm. likely her, her employer has never filled in those forms? What happens to her? What happens to those those little babies? You know that she has to whose mouths she has to feed. So it was really about you know figuring out this woman who now has to use um, other ways of, of navigating survival um, to, to feed herself and her family broadly, yeah. Next. Um, these, there was, the, there was a, quite a few of these works that I, I created. Um, and just for people to know, these are collages. So I use magazines, newspapers, but predominantly magazines. And um, uh, similarly, during lockdown, you know, um, the abuse of women and children has been a serious, um, it's, well, it's be, even before lockdown, it was a problem. But um, I found when listening to on the news stories of women, um, husbands killing wives, um, boyfriends killing girlfriends, and then really, you know, this idea of still at this day and age, we are suffering at the hands of our partners, of our close partners. And um, yeah, just creating a remark on that. Next slide. Okay. Oh, Thank that's you. it. Yeah. I'd like what you had to say about, you know, the, 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 the sort of narratives and the commentaries that were coming through there. It's sort of like in that space of reflection, there's still that outward looking. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing with issues that the world is, is, you know, I think for us to be locked down, we were suddenly experiencing all of these things um, through the lens of, you know, whether, whether it be a, a television screen or your cell phone or whatever news feed that you have, but you, your, your response to that was, you sort of sitting at home as a creative and doing something about it. So 
and something you haven't told everyone here is that you, in this time, you've created over 40 of these things, you know, just in, in the space of working on your kitchen table. So I think it's a good sort of segue into Jessica talking about looking in and looking out as an academic and as a practitioner who has, who had expectations in herself um, about her work, where it was, and then the pandemic hit. So Jess, you can take it away there. Thank you, Willie. Um, before I get into discussions on my own work, I would just like to pick up on two things that you and, and Ernestine mentioned earlier. Um, you know, Willie, with your conversation, I think it really um, drew attention to the, the scope of the creative industry. You know, it is not just that isolated artist um, working in their own space. You know, a, an artist, whatever creative field they're in, are, are connected to so many other people in so many other industries. Um, whichever country that they are, they're based in. And I think, Ernestine, something that you mentioned there was the kind of the ecosystem, the network of that industry, how all these different industries are interconnected and we do rely on each other. You know, so maybe just speaking from my own um, experience during this lockdown, um, you know, there have been several downsides to this, this situation for me, both personally and professionally. Um, you know, one of which is... Um, my general accessibility and my freedom to access materials. Um, cool. So, for instance, and this is a story that um, I, I see some of my students are here and they'll know the story. Um, our, our ink supplier that we use for, for printmaking, um, both staff and students alike, that ink supplier is no longer operating in Port Elizabeth. Um, you know, the company has relocated all their, their, um, all their equipment, um, all their production processes to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, so some, so what, what was once a very, you know, nice, accessible, cheap supply of really good quality ink is now no longer that accessible to us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also, that's not just affected us as creative people, you know, that's affected a whole industry. There are a lot of small businesses based around that, that supplier that have now really um, been put in a difficult position by not being able to access that product. Um, and that, you know, that wasn't just a product that was good for us, you know, that was actually a, an internationally um, competitive product that they were offering. Right. Um, another instance would be, um, you know, I was based in, in Stellenbosch for, for some years before returning to Port Elizabeth. And during my time there, you know, I developed a relationship with a, a framer there. Um, you know, with, with any creative industry, I think you, you find the people that you need to help, you know, um, support and and add value to your practice. And, you know, it may seem like a simple thing, you know, a framer, surely you can find a framer anywhere, but you know, that relationship is as important. It, it's a key stakeholder in your creative work. Right. And, and that framer unfortunately has closed down. Um, mm. So I did receive a number of artworks back from that framer during the lockdown. And it, it was quite sad to know that that was the last work I'd be getting back from them. Yeah. Um, you know, so in terms of, accessibility, um, you know, the, the other, um, other dimensions to my work, you know, those things have been affected. And, and then also as an educator, um, and, I, and I think for yourself as well, we've had to seriously shift the way that we offer um, our, our training and, and skill sets to students during this time, um, mm. both at a university level. And, you know, as I said at the beginning of the discussion, I, I am involved um, at Art on Target, that art school, and, and also in a collective and those other dimensions to my role as an educator just have not been able to go forward this year, um, sure. you know, for, for many reasons. So it, it has limited me in that way. And I, I think for a lot of artists who do actually rely on, on teaching as a source of income, you know, another source of income in addition to their work as artists, um, you know, they've no longer been able to, to have that, that other income. And right. it, again, it just adds, adds more pressure um, in this very difficult situation. I'd like to come back to that issue of resources and accessibility at the end of your presentation, because I think it's something that we need to talk about really in terms of, you know, um, if we were in Norway, for instance, and it's, Norway, I think, is one of the only countries that the government values their artists to such an extent that they pay them a stipend to be an artist. And, you know, what, what I, the question for me at the underlying all of this is like how we valued as creatives um, to such a degree that, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of, okay, fine, we'll bail you out because you have no money, but actually we need to support you through this time. It's not, it's not a question of like just, you know, um, 
will bail you out or give you money to afford and all the rest of it because the repercussions are to do with you know access to resources access to materials that you you pointed out um, ernestine like you know if we are going to work online how, what does this mean to the future of a student who has to learn the processes of of print of paint or whatever it is or a a musician for instance who has to um you know um pick up a, a particular fingering technique on the flute or something like that you know those are those are we're, we're dealing with the, the aspect of creative creativity now being addressed in the abstract and yet it's is it really and can it be fully fulfilled in that sense so that's that for me is one of the questions that i'd like to kind of come back to once you once you're done there Jess. so i'll hand over to you again great thank you um okay so we can go to the first slide then um and, I, and I'll, I'll just say in advance you know please excuse the image quality of these these photographs they have been taken at home and some before they were actually finished but i figured that also kind of tells the story of lockdown and the reality of what we're experiencing. So, you know, please just excuse that. Um, so yeah, as an artist, um, the lockdown was, was quite a creative space for me. You know, I went into it running on quite a lot of momentum. Um, I was due to have a solo exhibition at the GFI in May and about a month before that time, it was postponed. Uh, I was given the choice to host a virtual show or to, to, uh, to wait and I, I opted for the latter. Um, but the upside of that postponement is that I have had more time during the lockdown to, to create more work and even pick up ideas and projects that I had only just started or had felt that I had to let go at the time. So, you know, of course, lockdown was intensely restrictive and, and like many artists, you know, I had to turn to what was available to me in my home space for working. Um, and I think this first artwork, Touch and Go, is probably the best um, example of that. So this is the very first work that I created during lockdown. Um, over the years, I've been creating or uh, well, been collecting lots of bits of scrap paper and offcuts and cancelled prints um, from my printing processes. And I also have dozens of small bits of paper that I used to experiment with uh, when I was doing a marbling technique. So I marbled all that paper last year, but ultimately I never really got very far with the actual artwork those bits of papers were intended for. So I cut them up into three by three centimeter squares. I started arranging them and then I began stitching those to a number of canceled prints and proofs that were also in my drawer. So they're about 25 blocks. Each block contains 25 small squares and this artwork has since been framed. Um, from the outset, I didn't really have any clear design for the piece, but it goes without saying that the sudden unreality of COVID um, and the lockdown were very fresh in my mind when I began work. Um, so Bully, maybe skip to the next slide for me, please. Sure. Here's, the, here's the detail of that. Uh, yeah. moment, so people can get a better so sense. Just of that. A, a closer view of the marbling. Um, the next slide. Yeah, this and that's, that's the back of the work. So there you can actually see the stitches um, and the 25 blocks. Mm. So you know, this, this was a, a different process for me, but maybe the methodology I used was not so new, um, namely the, the process of cutting up existing prints and stitching them together. Um, mm. So that process developed from a work I completed at the very beginning of this year, The Passage of Time. Uh, next slide. So with this artwork, I also cut up existing prints and then stitched them together. And there is a, a, a side um, view, just a, with a little bit more detail. Yeah. All right. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Bully. All there right. So is. this work is titled mm -hmm. Cape Receive. Um, the wood block that I pulled this print from was completed in April. So also still fairly early into lockdown. And again, here I was limited to what I had in the home space. Uh, the wood block in the next slide um, was an offcut from a DIY project I did at home. And I was just fortunate that I had my woodcut tools with me at the time. Um, the printing of this actual work took place much later after lockdown had started easing up a bit and I used a combination of a spoon and a bottle to apply pressure um, to the block to then transfer the image from the block to a piece of fabric. Uh, the wood block itself is actually quite thick so even though printing with a press is always much easier um, it wasn't really an option for this piece. Mm. Uh, the image itself is of the lighthouse mm. and the surrounding structures are Cape Receive. Um, so with that piece, I didn't really just want to represent the lighthouse, but I think I wanted to capture something of the severity of that place on a rough day. 
um, you know, the jaggedness of the rocks, um, the, the fierceness of the ocean, and the, just the intense wind there. Um, about a few hundred meters offshore, there's a reef called the Thunderbolt Reef. So um, obviously the reef takes its name, uh, it, it takes its name from one of the many vessels that founded there before the lighthouse was erected. Um, and it's quite a changing place and it, it's interesting, um, it's an interesting place to go to and you know a lot of the human history of that place has also kind of been eroded or forgotten much like you know how that place has changed itself over the years. Uh, next slide please, thanks Willie. Um, so about a week or so into lockdown I made a, a collagraph plate out of scraps of cardboard again using what was available to me in the home space and at first I had plan to print that plate when I finally got back into a studio environment. But, you know, after a long wait with no end in sight, I wondered if it wouldn't be possible to do something else with that plate and frittage came to mind. Um, so the, the students that are here will know what frittage is. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a quite a straightforward process. Um, frittage basically means to rub and essentially you place a sur one surface on top of another surface and then take some kind of drawing tool or medium and then um, you make a rubbing of it you, so you can see that texture on the, the surface on top. Um, so when I finally got to the point that I did this frittage, I was able to access some fabric and um, I did a few frittages in hopes that at least one would be worthwhile and I, I felt this was the, the best one in the end. Next slide. Um, this one is titled When Things Become Visible. Um, it's still a work in process and it's something the it's something I've made quite recently. Um, you can see that this print is taken from the same plate that I used to make the frittage in the, the slide before. Um, but this one I actually printed using a printing press. I'm not entirely happy with the work at this stage and I think at some point I'll probably also end up cutting it up and turning it into something else. But that's <laughs> that's it in its current state. Okay. Okay, um, nearly there. So the second last work, this is titled Out Out. Um, I started work around this in February this year and I, I think I completed it just as lockdown began. And this work, um, it follows another work that I created at the end of last year called The Long Wait 100 Years on the Riverbank. Um, so you can go through those three slides please, Willie. So that's the long wait, that's from a side view, just so you can see the shift in the different um, surfaces, the different materials that I use there. And then finally, just a close up view of that one element of the long wait. Mm. Um, so both both this print and the one before Out Out are, are collagraph plates. And, you know, I, I think collagraph, it's, uh, I turn to that medium quite a lot during lockdown, just because again, it really does allow you to to work with anything that you have available to you and you know turn it into something um so that that's all for me in terms of my sure. you know, experience as an artist and, and creating work during the lockdown but you know as i've said there there have been lots of different levels to that experience um and i think we can go back to maybe discussing that more generally yeah something you said here jess which was um of interest to me really was i'm going to um, um stop the screen share here i think i think we can go back to looking at our faces perhaps um if that's all right andrea um something that um really struck out to me was the idea that you said limitation is a necessary um catalyst at some point you know the idea that perhaps you know the shutdown perhaps having to work within our resources. I know for myself as a, as a printmaker, I had a sort of small existential crisis because I was so bound to the, the machines I work with on a daily basis. And, you know, one can extend that to, you know, the, the idea that if you are a muse or a musician, if you are someone who is a, um, uh, a creative in any other form, but you're dependent in some ways on, on the, 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 the venues or the the equipments that, that that are provided for you to perform your your craft you know then that limitation could inspire a different way of thinking definitely you know you, what i think you did quite nicely was to kind of like move beyond the sense of the the press space and you know using bottles and spoons to print your your work from so i i um can i add to that yeah because what i you know i remember when lockdown first oh, happened and there was prior to south africa's lockdown it, it was you know other european countries and i remember uh, specifically italy and um 
again, the reality of artists was quite severe. Artists just couldn't work. But what I found that was extremely powerful was the fact that artists in their own apartments locked in their homes then began to, for example, musicians play mm -hmm. on their balcony to their mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. um, um, create productions on, you know, in the front of their homes to, to the appreciation of the community who maybe didn't even know they had an artist, a yeah. musician mm -hmm. next door. Um, and it became this really beautiful way of um, easing people's worries. Um, you know, you're locked in your home, you don't know what's happening, you don't know how severe this, this, um, this pandemic was, people were dying, people are still dying, but yet artists were the ones to really create a, a, um, a feeling of hope amongst mm -hmm. all of this dire situation, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. which I found extremely powerful. And exactly. um, so when we talk about resources and we talk about not having a venue, a venue, you know, um, but yet again, artists who are always able to make a plan, mm -hmm. you know, even though they were not being paid to perform mm -hmm. or to create what they are used to creating, it was a way of giving back to the communities that they served in a, in a completely, absolutely beautiful way. Right. Um, yeah. And I think as a result of that, there were all these other kind of virtual viral things that were happening on, you know, the sides of streets, empty streets where artists would perform and then they would upload that um, to the enjoyment of, of most people. And I think I remember also speak, people speaking about this idea of, you know, being at home. What are you going to do? You're watching TV, you're listening to music. Mm -hmm. um, those are things creatives do. Yeah. But um, in a society that doesn't appreciate us as, you know, as we should, where, you know, we were speaking earlier on um, the idea of art being earlier in uh, the curriculum of students. Mm -hmm. High school students, do they have art as a, as a way of starting to appreciate I was how just can, to... you know, contribute to their lives, not just economically, but just emotionally, psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at how other countries outside of South Africa appreciate their artists, as you've mentioned, um, on Norway, yeah. um, really providing artists with a stipend. But there are other countries outside of this space that we find ourselves in that really are able to show that appreciation. Um, and artists reminding the rest of the world that we are important, you know. You do need us. Not, not for your, you know, um, physical survival, but for your, your emotional survival, you need us. Oh, um, but what does that mean? Yeah. I, I think there's something very important that you said there, and I, I, it points right back to that. I keep using the word as the, um, you know, art as an economy, creativity as an economy. And I think that, you know, if, if society were to reflect in some ways that creativity actually bolsters people's lives, it, it, makes, it makes changes in ways that, for instance, the National Arts Festival, for instance, not, it not being in Grahamstown this year and being in the, in the virtual space, left the entire city of Grahamstown um, mm -hmm. without an income. And those are people who would be, you know, the street buskers, the, the coffee shops, the whatever it was, the, the, the drain on that economy um, without, a, and I'm not saying that we should blame someone for it because the pandemic happened and we had to lock down. But what it shows up is that with, without a fallback, without a plan B around how you think about the value of art in society in terms of maintaining the rest of us, you know, something bad like that can happen on a regular basis. I'd like to speak about teaching or uh, as well, Jess. I don't know if that, mm -hmm. in, teaching in the virtual for, for some of us who, you know, going to that tactile, tangible sort of space. No, for sure. Um, you know, it, it's actually this, this lockdown situation has um, really made me very aware of teaching on, on so many different levels and, and the value of it and um, the difficulties we, we have as um, young or just generally as um, in the South African context. Um, so yes, maybe first touching on the, the virtual reality now that um, we've had to engage with. 
um, you know, I've, I've never really thought of myself as a very um, digitally able person, um, although I have been learning over the years, um, depending on the different spaces in which I found myself, but it's, I've, it's been on quite a fast track learning curve now um, during these last months with lockdown. And, you know, on one hand, I'm able to do that, you know, I'm in a position that I can access the, the means to learn those skills, but the, the hard reality is that a lot of the students that um, I've been educating or that are at the university don't have access to those uh, those platforms, whether it's the device or data or so forth. So we have so many different levels of students now able to engage or, or not engage or maybe sometimes engage and then they disappear for a while. Um, so as an educator, there's been a lot more to kind of juggle. Mm. Um, and that's really, that's just my experience at the university. You know, as I've said, I'm also an educator on other platforms at an art school, which, um, you know, in that capacity, I'm largely teaching classes to adults. Um, mm -hmm. But I've also been an educator to junior and high school learners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other reality there is um, with a lot of those schools at which I was teaching, they don't have any kind of formal art education. Um, oh. the, the art education would come through... Um, at that time, it was the Access to Visual Arts program that was hosted by the Stellenbosch Museum. And mm. those short outings that those students would have to visit the art department and the museum, that, that would be the extent of their arts education. I think about 20% of the schools that came through actually had some kind of arts educator um, mm. on a more permanent basis. And that, that's a very small percentage given the number of schools that were going through that program. Um, you know, so, and the reality there is in a lockdown situation, there, there's no way um, the school or um, the government that's funding, you know, those programs would actually be able to continue them in any way. It, it wouldn't be given priority, you know. This, yeah. The reality now is that, you know, we're living in a country where in a crisis situation, support can't be given to artists. And I mean, I loved what, her, uh, what Ernestine was saying earlier about, you know, artists rising to the occasion, um, working within those limitations and actually making some very meaningful um, creative works and engagements mm. in this time. You know, but where do you draw the line? Where is, where is it okay that artists work that creatively, you know, versus not at some point offering some support for a more sustained lockdown okay. crisis situation? That's great. No, I, very, very pertinent. I mean, once you know, as you said just now, that if you if you take it away in, in the in the light of the pandemic, and all of a sudden you we, we have nothing, you know, how do you bolster? How do you grow from that? How do you make sure that it survives? Where's the sustainability element of it? Um, we've got about thirteen minutes left. We had a nice sort of like run of each of our inputs. I would like to ask the audience if there's anything they'd like to ask us or make comment of. Um, I can't see hands up as such. Let me just see, I can raise participants, but um, if people would like to say something, um, please do. Uh, Andrea? Lilla, um, I think it would be perhaps best to ask people to just make notes in, in the chat session and then sure. I will have a look at it and maybe jump in and read it out to you. If there are common right. questions, that would be, I think, the best way to do it. Otherwise, sure. I think maybe carry on with an absolutely fascinating discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. can, can I add to what you've been saying, Vuli? Um, and you know this this um, conversation around resources and accessibility. And in mm. your presentation, you you kind of outlined what you know, the national government had envisioned um, providing artists with, and what actually has taken place. Can I tell you what's actually happened? I'll just read it out here. So 150 million was set aside for people, right? Um, but the criticism of that was that the 150 million set aside by the department as a re refund has been widely criticized because the money came out of the existing budget for productions and events that were canceled during to, due to lockdown, rather than being additional emergency relief funds. So does it, that kind of like factors into like, well, you know, we were going to use this money on you guys anyway, in terms of your productions, there it is. Mm -hmm. But that was, that's, that's a finite. That's a, that's kind of like. Because how much, how much of that money actually went to these, these artists when I know particularly quite a few of my colleagues who are artists went through the process of application, their application was denied um, for whatever reason. And we are still sitting with artists who are going hungry. We're still yeah. sitting with artists who commit suicide because 
they have no means of of, of literally eating day yeah. to day. Um, the, cap was, the cap was twenty thousand rand, I think it was. Um, they they were they divided out about twenty thousand rand per per artist. I'm not sure if that was a set amount for the, the entire period of the pandemic or whether it was going to okay. be repeat or such. But the, um, as I, as I said to you, uh, this was in May April. Five thousand. By that time, five thousand people had applied, and only four hundred and eighty-eight people had received any pay. Wow! And what about rent? What about eating? You know, mm. so it it's in looking because I've I've been trying to follow the international kind of um, engagement around um, how artists are being supported or individuals in general. You right. know, um, in the U.S., there's been a a request to kind of um, freeze. Um, individuals having to pay rent right. for this COVID, you know, time period because people literally are struggling to eat. But again, Look. the reality we have is artists are going hungry. And Look. irrespective of whether, you know, only what from the 5,000 less than, a, you know, a, a quarter of the fraction of artists actually receive funding, what happens to the others? Has there been any engagement by national government to find other ways to assist them to say, okay, maybe your application was you you missed some things, but we hear you, we see you, we we want to be able to provide you with support. How can yeah. we help? So one of the things that you know you and I and Jess had a, a quick meeting before this, and we spoke um, a little bit about this. Um, we are fortunate enough, as we've, we've spoken about having the, the the access and resources and such, but we're also very fortunate enough to know that the networks. And you, you, we find that in these situations, the networks that are established to provide relief and all the rest of it are always about learning new, <laughs> making contact with a, a new person or making contact with a new body or this and that. So I think, you know, established contacts in, in many respects are part of the sustainability process within the artists and the creative space. Um, and I think it's something to, to be taken into account, whether we're teaching students at primary and secondary and all the rest of it, if they get to understand and establish networks of, of um, um, you know, to consistency, you know, knowing people and knowing how and making that, the contacts become um, part of your process. Because um, I think for the most part, like you say, if you're sitting and playing to your local club or whatever it is, and all of a sudden the theater venue is down, how do you then go online and say, I am this person and I'm going to broadcast myself now and try and live with this? Mm. I think we may have a question. Um, Oops. That's Gary. Okay, the question is actually from Gary, and Gary is saying, do you think artists were particularly disadvantaged during this period? Um, as mm. an art in a crisis of secondary value. So in other words, uh, would, would the creatives have been more disadvantaged than people who do other kinds of work? I think that's what, um, because of the fact yeah. that art yeah. is valued, that does seem to be something that's coming through. And I want to just yeah. jump on to Gary's question and ask you maybe to think about much more, because I think it's fascinating. You're talking a lot about the work you do as artists. Mm. Is that work? It's a very interesting question. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Is that work that, are you doing? That, I mean, there's lots of answers that you've already given here, but it's, it's for me, it, kept on cropping up as an absolutely fascinating question. Um, is it work? No, it is work, but what is the work? Um, okay, so just a, just a question to, and I see there a couple of, of um, um, questions coming in, so maybe I will keep quiet a bit and you can maybe just first respond to Gary and then I'll go on to deny. Um, Jess, do you want to take Gary's question? Um, um, yes. I, can... oh, so... <laughs> I said yes. Not <laughs> well, either. Either of you. I, I want to respond to something um, that that Prof Hurst raised. So, um, if Ernestine would like to respond to Gary's question first, that's sure. fine with me. Okay, Ernestine. Okay. Yes. Um, so, uh, the question of whether artists are more disadvantaged in this time period than any other form of employment. Um, I think we can't put a value on, on whether who's more than, I think everybody 
in, in some level are is disadvantaged. Yes, as I mentioned, you have the domestic worker who has nothing other than now trying to figure out how to find a way to feed her children when she hasn't, she doesn't have enough to save. She, I don't know how she's going to pay her rent. And that's a similar situation to most artists. Mm -hmm. um, so they are literally living hand to mouth. So unless you are a superstar artist who has a, a fat, you know, bank account and you don't really have to stress about any sort of crisis, um, most artists will be living hand to mouth. And I think that's a reality for a lot of South Africans, mm. whether you're an artist or not. Mm. Definitely true. Thank you very much for that, Ernestine. Um, I'm watching Can time. I yes, yes, Jess. Um, I, I think it, it also tails into uh, something I just wanted to comment on with um, what Prof Hurst was saying. Um, you know, Prof Hurst, you were talking about the work of artists and I might have misunderstood um, your comment, but you know, what comes to my mind um, when you say that is, you know, I know for myself as a, a young creative um, learning the ropes through this industry, and I know from my experience of speaking with other artists who've been in the industry much longer than I, very often in the South African context, we actually have to grow our industry. Um, we actually have, uh, the role of the artist is not just the production of the works of art, it's actually growing the industry that is going to support that practice, that's going to appreciate what you do. You know, I know as a printmaker coming into PE, um, you know, part of my, you know, I, I, I enjoy working as an educator and I really do enjoy teaching. So um, I, I really sort of um, wanted to get involved at Art on Target, but knowing that a lot of the people I'm teaching there are adults, you know, they are, they're working people. Um, a lot of the people going to that school, supporting that school, you know, they want to be there, um, but they didn't know anything about printmaking because it hadn't be really, really been on offer um, up until the skill set, you could say, arrived in the city. You know, I'm really, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet there. It's, the fact remains is that there wasn't that much known about that particular discipline um, until I started teaching there. And I didn't just see this as, you know, this is a nice activity for these people to be engaging with. Um, yes, Ernestine, you spoke about um, emotional growth, you know, that comes through art and that, that definitely factors, but it, it was also an education and this is a different art form. This is actually an industry that exists in Port Elizabeth. Um, you know, there, there are other options for you to, to invest in, you know, as people who are interested in art and want to buy art and be around art. Um, you know, so that's something that I've been doing and that's, that's not just for me, that's something all artists have to do when they find themselves in a community, they have to actually grow that community and grow that appreciation. Um, something, you know, something we were saying earlier is that art um, education isn't a given in South Africa from a junior or high school level. Um, it really is an exceptional case where art is offered as a subject um, that all students will take. Most often it's just an elective or it's not on offer at all. So already from a very young age, you're not growing the supportive community for the artists um, within this context. So, you know, you're talking about the work of artists. I think that's very much plays a role in that work is actually developing those communities and that appreciation. Great, great. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Um, we have a little bit of time, two minutes, and I see Danai has asked a question, and Sonavis was also <laughs> still questioning, but uh, Danai is asking, um, she's felt challenges of moving to the virtual space in terms of the teaching. How has it affected my ability to ensure all of my students were able to grasp and apply the material? Um, you're asking how it has affected us as educators in, in a discipline that relies heavily on practical and application and, and what is being taught. It really has, um, Dee. I think that there are um, so many things that are, that can be spoken of in the abstract. You can speak of, of language in the abstract. You can speak of, you know, writing in the abstract, I suppose. But um, I think just speaking from our discipline, we're three printmakers and we, we know that there's certain things that become muscle memory, the actual physical muscle memory. Mm -hmm. There's certain um, tangible and um, um, physical things that do have to happen in situ, in space. and Apart from that, it's the, it's the human contact space. You know, I think that there's the, the space of transference happens in a more um, um, intrinsic way 
when you are in contact with another person. There's something about the imprinting of knowledge on another person. And here we are as printmakers philosophically speaking about imprinting on people, but that is the truth. Um, it's not about looking over someone's shoulder while they're doing a painting and saying, no, put the brush there and make this color there and all the rest of it. I think in many respects, it's about that transference, that connection, that networking that occurs in a very sort of, um, it's quantum, I can say, <laughs> a quantum level sort of connection that is, you know, that is how the, the information is passed along. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you, you're taught to do something by rote. You're taught to feel how to make art. And it's that knowledge process that Jess is speaking about as well. You grow it. Brilliant, Lele. Um, sorry to jump in there. We, we are kind of edging towards the end. Well, we're not edging towards. We have kind of run out of time. But uh, um, perhaps it would be very nice to just answer um, the very last question and then sure. um, maybe wrap up. Um, okay. Um, I have so to say just quickly before you do that, there's yes. enough ideas and material here for a very interesting conference or symposium. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. I, I knew this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, I, I think so too. I mean, I, I like to, we'd like to maybe revisit the recording and perhaps take a couple of transcripts and grow something from there. Um, so I think the three of us, maybe, um, I see a paper heading our way, guys. Um, <laughs> but uh, let me see, so what you're asking, it would be interesting to hear a view about how the already disadvantaged indigenous art is or has been affected by the pandemic as Ms. Sinfeta White has rightfully noted that its space is not being well represented on, on an online presence platform as it should. Well, so Nobisa, I think the first thing one would ask is what's happened to um, not just the, the indigenous stuff, but what's happened to all the informal traders, for instance? What's happened to all those spaces where you would find crafters in their crafting markets um, being able to show their work and live off that, sustain themselves? Um, those markets being closed down, what's happened to all that um, support there? Um, I think I think those people are being even more at disadvantage at this point in time because the, if you really want to see people who are living off the, what they do it's, is definitely um, within that space. Um, Ernestine, do you have anything to add to that just quickly before we? Yeah, I think I think you know the reality is that technology is going to play and has played a major role in even those the livelihoods of those crafters. So for example, Facebook, you know, um, you're not able to sell your wares on the side of the road, but take a picture, you know, with your phone and upload it onto Facebook. And then people are like, okay, here's my number, call me, and then we can make an arrangement of how to get the works to you. So I think it's, it is this particular time period has really forced everyone to really understand that technology must be embraced, irrespective of which level of socioeconomic level you're in, um, and to find creative ways to market your, your wares and your work. Um, and the reality is most people are going to suffer. Most yeah. crafts, as you mentioned at the National Arts Festival, where they at that time period would have really made enough money for the rest of the year for them to survive on, now what has happened to them um and unfortunately they they are the the most disadvantaged at this time period sure thank you i think that's i think that's a great answer to sonobiso's question um and i think we do have to wrap up andrea um if yes you, i want to <laughs> i want to thank my uh, my colleagues my friends um for sharing time with me um and it's been so great to see you again and thanks Jess, for inviting me oh, it's a pleasure Thank you for organizing. And thanks, you. Jess, for um, participating as well. Thanks, Ernestine. It was really nice seeing you again. And great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Next, we'll have, please can we have a webinar on printmaking? Yeah, yes. I, I, <laughs> as a master printer, Tamarin like master printer, um, <laughs> I, I'm dreaming of just talking the lingo of printmaking these days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Andrea. <laughs> okay, thank you all very, very much for an absolutely fascinating and, and um, inspiring and um, invigorating um, hour of, of chatting. I mean, I'm thinking work, character of art, community, 
abstraction, digital economy, ecosystem. There are so many ideas here, so many things to think about. And certainly, I mean, a webinar on printmaking, go ahead, but we're doing a whole <laughs> <laughs> hopefully soon on art and art practicing. And I think it's been very inspirational. And thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my usual kind of desire is to have you just turn on your video before you say goodbye and sign off so that we can actually see a few faces. So, um, hi Gary, <laughs> hi Ethan, hi Peter, very nice to see you all. Um, and hey, um, cool. yes. hi David, hi, hi Victoria, hi. Victoria's head. <laughs> 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 Lovely to see you all and um, yes, uh, hopefully we will see you again next Friday for our, our, our next seminar and also for our um, conference <laughs> on art making. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you Thanks so much yeah. for joining us. Bye, I'm going to end now. Bye, Bye, thank you. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye. Bye. Cheers all. all. Bye. 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 <laughs> Lovely to see you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Ha, 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 ha.